tis the season, the most wonderful time of the year. Celebration with friends and family, it's time to pay tribute to this jolly month. So join us as we get into the Christmas spirit. You've heard of Elf on the Shelf, but this is Venom on the Shelf. It's quite simple. Eight-year-old Kevin McAllister, played by Macaulay Culkin, is accidentally left home for Christmas by his terrible parents, Catherine O'Hara, and the late great John Hurd. As they try to return to him in time, Kevin is tormented by local burglars, Harry and Marv, played by Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern, leading to Kevin fighting to protect his home, torturing the two men, and later becoming Jigsaw. You know what? I won't even lie. That's a fan theory that I can actually get behind. Excellent. The movie was actually originally a Warner Brothers film, but they weren't interested in the project and abandoned it for 20th Century Fox to take over. But director Chris Columbus began working on the movie a few years earlier when writer John Hughes helped him with National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. However, Columbus clashed with Chevy Chase and had to leave, which is when he was approached with the Home Alone script, which he loved. Patrick Reed Johnson nearly got the job but had other commitments and had to back out, but would later direct the terrible rip-off Baby's Day Out, so it's all good. Yeah? Hughes had a great experience working with the young McCoy Holy Culkin and Uncle Buck, but Columbus still auditioned hundreds of other children actors before meeting with Culkin and agreeing that he was the only choice they could go with. However, because of his age, he could only work until 10pm which caused production issues as a lot of the film took place at night. They specifically arranged filming around his schedule, so there are a lot of shots where Culkin is just in the frame by himself. To cast Harry, Danny DeVito, Jeremy Irons, Bob Hoskins, Al Pacino, Robert De Niro and John Lovitz were all approached but turned the part down. Rowan Atkinson auditioned. Nah. Shut up. Dudley Moore, Kevin Pollock and Phil Collins were considered, but Columbus idolised Joe Pesci but never thought he'd agree to a comedic role in a kids film and was pleasantly surprised. As for Marv, Daniel Stern was the first choice but they felt he would be far too expensive. Christopher Lloyd was allegedly approached but turned it down before casting Daniel Roebuck instead. They spent two days rehearsing but he lacked any chemistry with co-star Joe Pesci whatsoever so he was replaced with Daniel Stern after all. Roebuck did admit that it bothered him but he soon got over it and admitted it was just an unimportant experience to him. Merry Christmas. And funnily enough, Keanu Reeves and River Phoenix were both considered for the part of Kevin's older bully of a brother, Buzz. Nice move. Entertainment Weekly even voted Buzz as the second greatest movie bully in history. I couldn't find the list to see who was number one. No kidding. Robert's Blossom plays a neighbor, Old Man Marley, who the kids are convinced is a serial killer, and he actually considered this as one of the high points in his entire career. He would often get recognized in public by kids just asking, aren't you the guy? Ah, oh, shut up, will ya? Ooh. Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern were so accustomed to being in adult films, they both struggled to not curse, which is obvious any time they're in pain. Shoot! What? What happened? In fact, apparently Pesci kept accidentally swearing, so Columbus advised him to just use the word fridge instead. You can kind of hear it. And it was even harder that the young Macaulay Culkin was on set as well. However, there is one curse word left in, which was only said by Daniel Stern by complete accident when his shoe fell off mid-scene unplanned. Shit. Naughty. Sorry. Although Pesci did intentionally avoid Macaulay Culkin on set just to feed into the character and get Culkin to believe he really was as mean as he was portrayed. Scream. Filming lasted between February the 14th and May the 8th, 1990, and despite the selling point of the movie being the slapstick stunts, Columbus admitted that it wasn't funny on set. They would watch the scene take place and would just pray that the stuntmen were still alive. In fact, the stunts were going to be done with safety harnesses, but it was too obvious on camera. So they had to perform them without the aid of any safety equipment. One scene involves Harry threatening to bite Kevin's finger, but during an accident, he actually did it for real. And Culkin still has the scar. That scene's just weird. We'll get to that. I hope not. The famous McAllister house was a real house in Winnetka, Illinois, sporting five bedrooms, a fully converted attic, a detached double garage, and a greenhouse. And this home was sold in March of 2012 for $1.585 million. I would actually kill to live in that house. 
Yes! John Williams did the score, but John Hughes and Chris Columbus never thought this would be possible. But they managed to get in touch with Steven Spielberg to make the contact. Williams saw an early cut of the film and loved the whimsical and enchanting feeling it had agreeing to do the music. The movie was a hit with critics and fans alike, kids loving the humour and brutality getting even with the adults, but Roger Ebert wasn't a fan wanting it to be more realistic. He sounds like a hoot at parties. What's the matter? However, there were soon accusations of plagiarism at hand. In 1989, there was a French film called 3615 Père Noël, the story of a young boy who is home alone with his elderly grandfather. Well, he's not home alone then, is he? I told you something's wrong. And he has to fend off his home from an invader dressed as Santa Claus. And it's believed that the similarities are far too obvious. The director, Rene Manza, threatened to sue the makers of Home Alone. However, it was revealed that Père Noël wasn't even released in the United States at this point, and it wasn't even widely available there at all until 2018. Yeah, you don't have much of a case there, mate. This is ridiculous. I still love this movie. It holds up in a lot of ways, but I can't help but feel we ignore Macaulay Culkin's performance based on pure nostalgia. Now don't get me wrong, Culkin improves a lot in the sequel and, you know, he'd go on to become an amazing actor. But in this one... Mom, Uncle Frank won't let me watch the movie, but the big kids can. Pack my suitcase. This house is so full of people, it makes me sick. When I grow up and get married, I'm living alone. Cars are still here. They didn't go to the airport. My God, none of it sounds genuine. I mean, some of it I get. I'm sorry. I mean, at least there, it's a kid clearly trying to manipulate his mum, so it's going to sound fake. But everything sounds fake. He's charming in some scenes, but when he's trying to be genuine or upset, it doesn't work. But apparently, Culkin was really grown up and professional on set, impressing everyone. Joe Pesci described him as a fully grown man in a child's body. Huh, just like Michael Jackson. Hey, did you by any chance pick up a voltage adapter thing? No, I didn't have time to do that. Well, how am I supposed to shave in France? They do have razors that aren't electric, you know. Grow a goatee. You still need to shave. Do you know what a goatee is? Do you know what I should pack? I was told you, cheek face. Cheek face? What kind of insult is that? Hey, nose head. Is it true that French babes don't shave their pits? Some don't. But they got nude beaches. Buzz, you're like 13. Stop it. Can I sleep in your room? I don't want to sleep on the hide bed before. If you have something to drink, he'll wet the bed. I wouldn't let you sleep in my room if you were growing on my ass. Okay, who cares? Buzz is awesome. But oh no, an old friend of Kevin shows up. Who is he? Cops don't arrest him. Not enough evidence to convict. Yeah. Look out! I do love how everyone ignored the cop, but as soon as the delivery guy shows up, oh hey, pizza! I'd like a word with you, sir. Am I under arrest or something? Yes, we have evidence to suggest that you starred in the telephone. What the hell were you thinking, sir? It's uh, Christmas time. There's always a lot of burglaries around the holidays. So we're just checking the neighborhood to see if everyone's taking the proper precautions. That's all. Oh, yeah. Well, we have uh, automatic timers for our lights, locks for our doors. That's about as well as anybody can do these days, right? But no alarm. How the hell do you have all that stuff, but no alarm? Have you seen your house? Did anyone order me a plain cheese? <laughs> Okay, who orders just a plain cheese pizza? You deserve to be abducted! Culkin's real-life brother plays his on-screen cousin Fuller, who's a frequent bedwetter, but... He literally has a drink and smiles at him. He seems to get some sick satisfaction from pissing on people. This kid needs some help! And early on, there's a mess, and if you watch carefully, Mr. McAllister accidentally discards an extra boarding pass, which would have been Kevin's. Are they deliberately trying to lose their kid? My biggest issue here is... Why did they even need this? I mean, sure, if they got to the airport with one extra boarding pass and one less child, they'd realise they forgot Kevin and there'd be no movie. But the staff don't even check the boarding passes. They get their last minute and rush on without being checked. So this whole dad throwing away Kevin's pass is entirely pointless. It just makes it look even more contrived and forced. And they all blame Kevin for charging Buzz, but they all ignore the fact that he was antagonising him. In fact, this entire family hates Kevin for no reason. They all insult him in front of his parents and they do nothing. 
nothing. They call him a disease and everything. Jesus, no wonder he turned evil in the good son. That's the real Home Alone 2. Uncle Frank is the worst and just makes Kevin's life miserable. There was even a deleted scene in Paris where he yells at his own son Fuller, so I guess it isn't specific to his nephew. But there was also another deleted scene where Uncle Frank tells Kevin that the French will call him Yank and then he proceeds to pull his trousers down. Buzz also would have refused to let Kevin sleep in his room and there was a deleted scene where he threatens Kevin if he doesn't leave, he would nail him to old man Marley's front door. Jesus! And if you thought that was dark... In the original script, Uncle Frank was going to be revealed as the real villain. It was going to be exposed that Harry and Marv actually worked for him and that he hired them to rob the McAllisters, the other houses in the neighborhood, and to murder his nephew, Kevin. John Hughes, are you okay? Yeah. But how does nobody see through Harry's fake cop act? Don't worry about me. I spoke to your husband already. And don't worry about your home. It's in good hands. Because that's not creepy. There are 15 people in this house. You're the only one who has to make trouble. Except Buzz. Everyone in this family hates me. Then maybe you should ask Santa for a new family. Or maybe stop acting like a cunt. I can't let this go. Instead of comforting her child and reassuring him that they all love him no matter what, she just says, Then maybe you should ask Santa for a new family. What a bitch! I mean it. His family blame him for everything and his mum makes this entire situation so much worse. You'd feel pretty sad if you woke up tomorrow morning and you didn't have a family. No, I wouldn't. Then say it again. Maybe it'll happen. Who talks this way? They wanted this to happen! This entire family is abusive! It's also quite weird. The movie seems to make out like him wishing them away is literally the cause of this. Yeah, it's not an electricity fault. It's him wishing on Christmas. And somehow, everyone in this damn house sleeps in. Everyone! And then Kevin somehow doesn't hear them all rushing around to get ready and get out in time. And somehow, when counting heads, Kevin's sister or cousin, I don't know, I can't keep track, includes herself twice and this annoying neighbour and still gets the correct number of kids. How the hell did that happen? In this one, Buzz would have had a pick on Kevin so much he'd flip and cause a mess. Mr. McAllister had to have discarded a boarding pass, the electricity then would have had to cut out, all 15 members of the family refused to wake up, then Kevin doesn't get woken up, then they all get to the airport and sit down without realising because the airport staff didn't bother to check their boarding passes. All of these movies require you to suspend your disbelief, let's just be honest. Sure. I do find it hilarious though how Kevin wakes up, clearly sees that nobody is home, and just casually stares around the kitchen to see that nobody is there, and he's just like, oh look. Everyone's gone. Eh. Don't you feel like a heel flying first class with all the kids back in coach? Wait, wait, they're in first class and the kids are back in coach. It's not like you haven't got the money. What kind of parents are these? Oh, the kids are fine back there. You know, let's just drink our free champagne. Oh, yes, yes. First class is wonderful. The kids are fine. They've got Buzz. He's responsible. <laughs> it is really charming, though, when he finally realizes he's home alone. It's a wonderful moment that I think all kids imagine and wish for. Then he runs around screaming. I mean, is this really what you do if you're home alone? But then he fat shames Buzz's girlfriend. Buzz, your girlfriend. Woof. Actually, that was a guy in drag. Chris Columbus said that he'd only get a guy to do it because he didn't think that we should talk about any woman in that manner. Which, in a way, is actually more sexist. Yeah. And, of course, the famous movie within the movie is awesome and we need this to be made for realsies it really is a charming kid's fantasy though which is why i can let go of the lack of realism and logic he's watching movies he shouldn't whilst downing copious amounts of ice cream this is every kid's dream what a pussy man i watched the fly at his age and yeah she doesn't realize he's missing until nightfall but it's cool i'm sure kevin's fine back there in coach wait how is it even nightfall they rush to the airport in the morning, Chicago time. Not long after, it's nightfall on the plane. But it's an eight or nine hour flight. Yet when they arrive in Paris, it's broad daylight. Chris Columbus failed geography. What else can we be forgetting? Beetlejuice 2, hurry up and make it, bitch! The antics Kevin gets up to on his own are really charming, but look at the position of these stairs. There is no way he's getting out that door. What kind of mother am I? If it makes you feel any better, I forgot my reading classes. Okay, Uncle Frank is a complete dick, but kind of amazing at the same time. 
And despite not waking up earlier, a car door now does it. But it is quite creepy as he sees Harry and Marv's shadows approaching the house. But these criminals kind of suck. What, they're not wearing masks and have fingerless gloves? They even check the back door and say, I thought you said they were gone. So you didn't try the front door first just to check? But Kevin psychs himself up, convincing him there's nothing to be afraid of, but then... <laughs> okay, that was really well done, and his acting was fine. But why does Marley just stand there and act like a serial killer? And then he breaks the fourth wall for some reason. Then we see this cop who looks like a female Woody Harrelson, and Mr. Heckles from Friends plays Sergeant Bullsack. You want us to go to your house just to check on him? Why are they making it out like this is an absurd request? He's a child on his own! You want us to check? On a child alone? Blah, 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 blah. This is no emergency, what the hell? And what, none of the neighbours are home for Christmas? They say they keep trying their phones, but the phone lines are down! How is that possible? We get scenes where they're ringing the answering machines. That can't be done! The phone lines? are down! And get this, a cop tries the house, even though Kevin clearly left it unlocked earlier, knocks a few times, no and that's it. Eh, a kid was left alone and has now vanished. No big deal, house is secure. Never brought up again. These cops are awful! It really is a touching moment though. The family decide to go back to the hotel, but his mum refuses to leave the airport. Unlike the second one where she's like, meh, I tried back to the hotel. The motherly son bond in this one is beautifully handled. You know, aside from neglecting him and allowing people to abuse him on a constant basis. Harry and Marv are great in this. I love how Marv doesn't even try to be quiet and stealthy. Amazingly, Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern had no faith in this movie whatsoever. They both fully expected it to be a disaster, so they intentionally gave really over-the-top performances. So it's a bit rich for Stern to call the fourth one a disgrace. Mate, you thought this one would suck too. And John Hurd even hated the film and had no faith in it. He later apologised to Chris Columbus after being proven wrong with its sheer financial success. There's a scene where Kevin goes to buy a toothbrush, but old man Marley shows up, again still acting like a psychopath for some reason, and Kevin gets scared and accidentally steals the toothbrush. And a lot of people were said, you know, during this entire movie, why doesn't Kevin just call the police? I mean, burglars are after him. Well, one, he can't, the phone lines are down. But two, in a child's mind, he will now be arrested for stealing that toothbrush. I mean, he even says, I'm a criminal. See? But would you really chase a damn kid this far over a damn toothbrush? I do find Marv hilarious though. He leaves the taps running as some sort of dastardly plan, giggling as he does it. He's so petty, it's hilarious. What's wrong with you? Why do you do that? I told you not to do it. Harry, it's our calling card. Calling card. All the great ones leave their mark. We're the wet bandits. You're sick, you know that? You trash and rob houses and try to murder a child later, but leaving the water running, that's sick. And they soon spot Kevin and begin to follow him, but they make it so obvious. And then they wonder why he panics. See, I knew he looked at me weird. Why would he run? Two creepy old guys in a van are following him. But Kevin using all these cardboard cutouts to trick him is damn near impossible. He's even operating the strings in front of a damn window. He wouldn't even know when they're going to turn up. So is he just doing this all night long? And what would have happened if the cops showed up again? Hey, miss. Yeah, your kid's not there. But th there are a lot of people having a party in your home tonight. I just love how the family are just kicking it knowing Kevin could be dead. Oh, shrimp. Yes, the finest you can eat. And it's just hilarious. A buzz always acts like Kevin is the asshole. You're not at all worried that something might happen. To no, for three reasons. A, I'm not that lucky. Two, we have smoke detectors. And D, <laughs> and he's so dumb, it's hilarious. We live in the most boring street in the United States of America, where nothing even remotely dangerous will ever happen. You think a serial killer lives next door? Kevin even tricks the poor pizza guy using the VHS tape to make him believe he has a gun, probably traumatizing the poor guy, but he never reports this. You've just been shot at. And would you really not be able to tell the difference between a real gun and a VHS tape? A lovely cheese pizza just for me. At least add some pepperoni for Christ's sake. I'm begging you from a mother to a mother, please. But it's your fault. All of this is your fault! Stop with the guilt tripping! This was actually a concern of John Hughes, that the audience wouldn't sympathise because a mother just wouldn't forget her child. <laughs> You've not met my ex-wife. Chris Columbus claimed that John did a great job filling in every possible logic hole so the audience will buy it. But no! 
No, we won't. It's her fault. But somehow when kevin starts to miss his abusive neglectful family you actually do feel sorry for him and want them to reunite i don't know how they managed to do it but they actually do pull it off but then it immediately cuts to kevin singing in a towel well that sadness didn't last very long and then he uses the aftershave again they did the same gag twice why would you try it again? And considering he used a VHS tape earlier to trick the pizza guy, it doesn't make much sense why he would then go out and go to the supermarket alone. But it is really funny and charming when he and the cashier have a little exchange. Where's your mom? My mom's in the car. Where's your father? He's at work. What about your brothers and your sisters? I'm an only child. Where do you live? Uh, I can't tell you that. Why not? Because you're a stranger. But what eight-year-old is going to do the laundry? I'm sorry, but what eight-year-old at Christmas, his family's just gone, what eight-year-old is going to have laundry on their mind? And how does he even know how to do the laundry? I didn't even know how to do the laundry until I was like 21. I don't get it. I mean, right now it looks like there's nobody home. Last night the place is jumping. So maybe they're all hung over and asleep? And like before, Marv again just tries the back door immediately to get in. But at least this makes more sense, Marv believing the TV scene is real, considering he's really stupid. I've been from Chicago, to Paris, to Dallas, to... Where the hell am I? Scranton. I am trying to get home to my eight-year-old son. That I abandoned and neglected and let everyone mistreat and abuse in the first place. Oh, and there is a genuine conspiracy theory that this is Elvis Presley. Yeah, because if you faked your death and go into hiding, wouldn't you be an extra in a Christmas kids movie and looking like Al from Home Improvement? This scene is hilarious. John Candy's scenes are all completely improvised and he did them all free of charge. But you can tell that Catherine O'Hara has no idea what to do or how to react. I think we're getting scammed by a kindergartner. <laughs> <laughs> why does Marv look high? And why do they just assume that Kevin's on his own? They've seen him like twice. We'll unload the van, we'll get a bite to eat, we'll come back about nine o'clock. Why not now? You've been robbing houses in broad daylight this whole movie. Then they spout exposition and clear earshot of Kevin so he knows the precise time. How convenient. And of course, they have to do the cliche of Santa being an arsehole away from the kids. Oh, I miss being neglected, emotionally abused and mentally destroyed by my family. But hey, old man Marley is suddenly inexplicably nice all of a sudden. You can say hello when you see me. Well, I would if you stopped acting like Hannibal Lecter. But this scene is quite cute, as Marley explains he fell out with his son and doesn't get to see his granddaughter anymore, and Kevin gives him some motivation and advice. It's really sweet, and unlike the sequel, this message isn't disturbing and offensive and moronic. Then he rushes home, to the house he always leaves unlocked, despite knowing burglars are coming. But the music really boosts you and get in the mood. Yeah, here we go, shit's about to get down! This is my house, I have to defend it. Yeah, you do! Okay, in moments like this, Colkin really nails it. But how the hell did he take the time to draw up this map and get all of these booby traps? <laughs> traps. <laughs> what do you mean? In less than an hour. There's no way! And he coats the steps with water to be slippery, but then paints tar on the basement steps. But, um, uh, now he's trapped. How is he getting out of the basement? And not only does he sit down to eat mac and cheese with a knife and fork like some kind of barbarian, but why is he even sitting down in the first place? He knows they're showing up any minute now. We're not gonna hurt you. No, no. Got some nice presents for you. You know, I often wondered why they have a doggy door when they don't have a dog or a cat. But if you listen very closely at the start... No, we're not bringing the dog. I'm putting the kennel for the... Hey, hey, hey. I'm just more annoyed why they couldn't fork out the money to... Get a dog in at least one of the scenes. Just just one scene at the start. Why was that so hard? But how are none of the neighbours spotting these two grown-ass men clearly trying to break into this house in plain view?
And yeah, okay, these traps would clearly severely injure or maim them, but it's not to the absurd extent of the sequel, so I'll be biased and say it's okay here, shut up. But this is a kid who couldn't even pack his suitcase earlier! But Harry even burns his hand on the door handle, how is this not gaining the attention of anyone? They're not all away, it's Christmas Eve! A dead kid. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Kevin! What would have happened if that was Marv? His face would have been completely cremated. Yeah, Marv would be dead and Kevin would have one on his body count. You're sick, Kevin. But Harry bursts through the back door and seconds later, Marv is right there. How did they not cross paths or even hear each other? But after all these horrific death traps, Kevin then covers him in feathers. Really? All these death-defying pranks and then pfft, now you look silly. Even Chris Columbus hated this trap, saying it was a lot more tame than the other ones. So, don't use it. Oh, thanks. But Marv stepping on ornaments, wouldn't you look down first? It's like my girlfriend when I forget to put the toilet seat down. Do you not look before you sit? You just you just walk in the bathroom like, ah. yeah, yeah. oh! Falling in, I should have looked first, but I never looked down. Or oh, all these times I accidentally get on a bus and I just sit on someone's lap because I don't look where I'm sitting in the first place. But hey, this movie has two amazing improvised lines in the span of 10 seconds. Why the hell are you dressed like a chicken? You guys give up or you're thirsty for more? Neither in the script. But despite its brutality, it's so charming. This is every kid's fantasy. We've all imagined getting our own back on the evil grown-ups. You bomb me with one more can, kid, and I'll snap up your cojones and boil the motor oil! Jesus Christ! Wait, then he calls the cops. But the phone lines are down. How, how is he doing this? And if he can do this, why did he wait this long before doing so? I guess it is a valid plot hole then. God damn it, movie, you nearly had it. But it's a good thing Buzz's pet tarantula didn't accidentally get crushed this entire time so it could be used for this. Marv's man scream is hilarious though, and this was real. Daniel Stern was informed that tarantulas don't have ears, so he screamed as loudly as he possibly could, and later found out that the tarantula's poison hadn't actually been extracted. Safety first, Columbus, yeah? Safety first. Don't get scared now. Okay, maybe I can let the traps go, but he had the time to set up a damn zip wire. He's scared of a furnace, but not a zip wire. Who cares? Him swinging on it is so whimsical and magical, it's great. And Harry and Marv have such great chemistry together. Before another amazing ad lib from Stern. Where'd he go? Maybe he committed suicide. Fucking hell, the 90s didn't care. And they literally try to climb the damn rope across. I get that Marv is dumb enough to try this, but it's Harry who suggests it. And how is nobody seeing this? Imagine going outside and seeing this in your garden. Also, credit to Daniel Stern doing all of this with no shoes on. How is this not choking or hanging him? Is he wearing a super jumper? And Harry threatening to bite off Kevin's fingers is just weird. It's such a bizarre threat, but of course they take forever so the creepy murderer can make the save. Yeah, they can survive irons and blow torches, but this shovel is too much. But he's so charming, even when he's smug and waves goodbye to them, he's so cute. God damn it! John, you wanna talk about bad parents? Look at look at us. I mean, we're on the road 48, 49 weeks out of the year, we hardly see our families. Uh, you know, Joe over there, gosh, you know, he's he forgets his kids' names half the time. Ziggy over there, he doesn't even, he's never even met his kid. Don't worry, all of us are terrible parents. I left my kids with Chris Benoit. Oh, and yeah, he somehow tidies up all of that mess in just a few hours. Seriously? All jokes aside, despite her being the cause, them reuniting is really emotional and sweet. It feels earned. I don't know how they manage it. And to this day, Macaulay Culkin still calls Catherine O'Hara a mum. Aww. Merry Christmas, sweetheart. Fuck you, you abusive bitch! Oh, but that smile, it's so warming and sweet. Oh, god damn it. And despite her using all of her money and belongings to get home early, the rest of the family show up just seconds later anyway. And then Buzz is cool with Kevin, which lasts about 10 seconds. Are you shopping? I got to milk, eggs, and fabric softener. No, you didn't. You got detergent. No kidding. 
What a funny guy. I'm funny how? I mean, funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you, I make you laugh, I'm here to fucking amuse you. And then everyone literally ditches Kevin immediately again straight after. Can't wait to abandon you again next year. The original is a classic and a must see for the Christmas period. Kevin is charming despite some bad acting and you do have to suspend your disbelief for a lot of the story, but it's a child's fantasy and it adds to the charm. It's supposed to be exaggerated, but in that same respect, it has made me warm more to the second one. My issue with the sequel was the level of realism, but looking back, this had the same issue, just not to the same extent. But the original is still a damn good movie and should be in the 1001.